Hey, welcome everyone. My name is Joey Lovestrand and I am a British Academy postdoctoral fellow at SOAS University of London hosting this webinar on behalf of the linguistics department at SOAS. Our speaker today is Dr. Chelsea Senker, who is a lecturer in the linguistics department at Yale University with expertise in phonetics and historical linguistics. Chelsea will be speaking to us today about the effects of recording devices and software on phonetic analysis. And this is based on ongoing work with colleagues at Yale. This is, of course, a timely topic as many linguists have had to adapt to new recording devices and software and will no doubt be more inclined to continue to use this technology uh, that allows recording at a great distance. Chelsea will be speaking for about 30 or 40 minutes, followed by a period of time using the rest of our hour together for further discussion and questions from participants. You'll note uh, that I'll be activating a live auto transcription that will be available in Zoom. If you prefer not to have this, you can deactivate it in your own Zoom by clicking on the live transcription button in your app. Chelsea, thank you for preparing this presentation to share with us today, and we look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So yeah, I'm going to be talking about how different recording devices and different software influence the phonetic results when we make measurements, which is collaborative work with the rest of the Yale uh, Linguistics Field Work Group. So yes, yeah, so of course, with the pandemic, this has changed what sort of research we can do and has uh, imposed limitations on our ability to do in-person research. So a lot of people have shifted to collecting data remotely in various ways which makes it important to know how these different methods of making recordings using different recording software like Zoom um, or using different devices that people happen to have at home is going to impact our acoustic measurements. So there are a variety of different potential sources of variation. So there are effects of compression is different software compresses in different ways and this can influence measurements of frequency and also measurements of duration, particularly when you have variable compression. So different things, uh, different parts of the signal being compressed in different ways. We also have filtering. So things like Zoom has its own filters to boost certain frequencies to reduce background noise. And this can influence particularly aperiodic noise, but also overall intensity and the relative intensity of different frequencies. And then there are all the familiar concerns that we've seen from previous work, which actually has been uh, studied in some detail, looking at effects of sampling rate, uh, ambient noise, shielding uh, to reduce interference from other electrical devices, microphone placement, microphone sensitivity. So basically all of the concerns about having a slightly different physical setup, which can change um, your results in addition to differences from software. So we had two phases of gathering data. So in phase one, we made simultaneous recordings on six different devices. So one speech event being recorded in six different ways. And I'll show you an image of what that setup looked like in a moment. And then in phase two, we transmitted recorded speech over four different uh, conferencing applications to look at how that software is impacting the recordings. And then we were comparing each of these against our gold standard, which was a solid state Zoom H4N recorder. So the stimuli were uh, 94 target words uh, embedded in the carrier sentence, we say X again, elicited in randomized order from three native speakers of English. And it was just three because we wanted to have exactly the same setup for everyone. So we were limited by who could come into campus and sit at our little array of devices. So these were designed so that we could test a variety of parameters of different types. Um, so measurements of duration, of frequency of aperiodic noise, and later I'll show you the full list of all the things that we measured. So we wanted to look at both the raw measurements and also specifically the relative measurements. So when you have contexts where these characteristics are part of phonological distinctions to see whether we can capture those distinctions. So things like F0 as a correlate of stress uh, and onset voicing. So here's what our array looked like uh, in phase one. So you can see the six different devices numbered here. So you can see which one is which. So we had the H4N recorder. That's the one numbered one. We had two cell phones. 
we had an iPad and we had one computer recording with the internal microphone and one uh, recording with an external microphone, a headset microphone. So you can't see the headset here because the speaker would be wearing it. And then the chair that you see in the front is where the speaker would be sitting. So then in phase two, we took the recordings from the H4N solid state recorder. Henceforth, we're calling it the H4N recorder to avoid confusion with the Zoom program. And then played those through the sound card of one computer to send it through another computer to another computer through each program. So basically, it gets treated as if it is the input from an external microphone. Um, so this ensures that you have identical signals that are being transmitted through each of these recording trans, uh, recording conditions. So it's not quite the same as having live speech, but we really wanted to make sure that we were capturing differences that were just due to the program instead of potential differences of what microphone was being used as the input for different programs. So in this phase, what we were testing, uh, the programs we were testing were Zoom, Skype, Clean Feed, which is a program that often gets used for podcast interviews and is focused on having clear audio, and Facebook Messenger, um, which doesn't have built-in recording capabilities, um, so you have to record in the background when we were using um, Audacity. But we had a separate condition just using Audacity alone to see when we have effects in the Messenger condition, is it due to Messenger or is it due to Audacity? So this selection of programs was basically based on things that we personally know some people are using, which are freely available um, and could all be tested in the same way. So for the acoustic analysis, first we converted the audio files um, to a sampling rate of 16,000 hertz, um, uncompressed mono wave files, because it was important that they all had the sampling, same sampling rate, same file type, so that effects weren't going to be due to that. Um, because different devices do have different sampling rates. And we already know what the effects of sampling rate are. We didn't want to test that. So it's important to have everything um, be the same there. And then this is also the sampling rate that's required by the pen forced aligner, which is what we use to do segmentation. Um, so forced alignment in this case is useful because you know that it's going to be systematic in what cues it's going to be using. So um, manual segmentation done by human segmenters is slightly more accurate, but is going to be more variable because uh, you don't have the same systematicity in what is being used to identify boundaries every time. Um, and when you have this sort of clear, slow lab speech, forced alignment is extremely accurate. So then we extracted measurements from our target words using scripts in prot. And then we did our statistical analysis using mixed effects models uh, with the fixed effect being either device for phase one or program for phase two with the reference condition being the H4N recorder. And we had a random intercept for speaker and performance and center of gravity measurements. We also had a random intercept for segment. So of course our set of measurements is not exhaustive. Uh, it is just a selection of things that we're trying to cover to see what are the types of issues that we're likely to see. So you have measurements that are basically looking at duration, measurements that are basically looking at aperiodic noise and measurements of frequency. And all three of these types of categories exhibit effects. So you do see differences in the specific measurements uh, and how they get uh, impacted. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what types of issues we're likely to see that are influencing our measurements uh, in each of these categories. So in many of our conditions, we see effects on duration. So consonant duration being underestimated and vowel duration being overestimated. And there are two main sources of effects on duration. So partially this is due to compression that's being used by various programs um, and in some of the device conditions based on what uh, program is being used to make the recording in that device. So if you have compression, um, lossy compression can result in effects in timing that some parts of the signal are compressed more than others um, and the decompression doesn't uh, end up sort of reconstructing the same exact duration that you started with. So you do see effects uh, of that where you get non-identical durations um, within the recordings, but you also get effects that aren't directly altering the timing of things within the recording, but alter our ability to measure it. Um, because if you have changes in the degree of background noise or the intensity of the signal, this can 
obscure the boundaries and our ability to identify them. So that's what I'm illustrating here in these two figures. So this is the same word tug, where you can see that final G doesn't have a full closure, so it has some formants. So this is actually me saying tug. Um, and as recorded by the H4N recorder, you have this clear drop in intensity and you have that fairly early boundary between the vowel and the G. But as recorded by the iPad, you have a lot more background noise. So you don't have that really clear boundary. It's just more of a gradient that the formants are sort of changing and they get slightly less intense, but it isn't quite as clear where you would want to put that boundary point and it ends up getting put much later. So this isn't just an issue of forced alignment. This is the same sort of doubt that uh, a human would also have when saying, well, where do I want to put that boundary? Because you can see that some boundaries are clear and you have a lot of agreement across the different conditions, like what we have between the, the initial T and, and the vowel. But we do get this variation that's due to not the actual duration of the vowel has changed within the recording um, in this case, but just our ability to identify that boundary has been obscured by the differences in how much background noise there is. So the next thing I want to talk about is aperiodic noise. So we have some effects that are caused by differences in how much background noise is being captured and how well the speech signal itself is being captured, as well as uh, filtering that's meant to remove background noise or boost the speech signal. Because even though you have these sort of enhancement um, methods like Zoom uses that are supposed to make speech clearer, they are changing what's actually going on in the signal, um, which means that it's going to influence our phonetic measurements. So these sorts of factors can directly impact measurements that actually involve measuring degree of aperiodic noise, like the harmonics to noise ratio uh, or the center of gravity. And then it can also have indirect effects in how well target characteristics are identified, like I mentioned before for duration, but also for things like uh, identifying formants or other um, periodic signals the more noise you have in the recording, um, the less reliably you'll be able to identify those. So, so this has both direct effects um, and indirect effects. And you see this both in device conditions based on how much is this microphone picking up of different parts of the signal, um, but also in the program conditions based on what sorts of filters they have. And then we have measurements of frequency. So formants in particular were impacted in several conditions. Um, and this is likely to be a result of several different factors. So partially lossy compression, um, but also filtering uh, and how much noise is being picked up. So depending on how the compression system handles repeating waves, they might get over-regularized or they might be obscured if it's not accurately identified. Um, but you also get changes due to filtering, particularly if you have these programs that are boosting particular frequencies or suppressing particular frequencies, which are going to change the intensity. And when you change the intensity, um, then this can shift measurements of frequency that basically, if you have a higher intensity, slightly higher in the bandwidth of a formant, it's going to change the measurement of that formant um, to be higher. And then of course, changing the intensity of frequencies also directly impacts things like spectral tilt, um, which we'll see how is impacted in all of our program conditions. So here's a summary of all of our results for phase one. So uh, how to read this table, each cell is giving the estimate for that factor. So how much the measurements given for that device for that measure differed from our baseline H4N recorder. And then we have stars to indicate a uh, significance level. Um, and for readability, only the significant results are included. So the empty cells are ones that didn't reach significant. But it's important to remember that that basically is just about, did we have enough data in order to find a significant effect? So don't look at those empty cells and say, ah, that was being perfectly captured. It just means that it was either more variable or a smaller effect. But that doesn't mean that these were identical. So it just means that the ones that we did find significant effects in were large and consistent. So you can see a few things um, uh, that are worth noting. So one is that the internal microphone had substantially more effects than the external microphone. Um, so 
uh, even though they're both being recorded by very similar computers, there is a difference uh, in the internal microphone um, not being as good at capturing the signal based on both you know, the directionality of the microphone, what frequency is it sensitive to, and how much noise it's picking up um, from the computer itself, a computer fan, and so on. We can also see a difference between um, the two Apple devices. So we have the iPad and the iPhone, which are very similar, except that we use different settings for the recording, one that's compressed and one which is uncompressed. And we do see that compression results in more differences. And there are a variety of other things that I wanted to comment on, one of which is the center of gravity. So you'll note that we have these huge effects for center of gravity. And partially that is because of our sampling rate. So you. Um, when you have a low sampling rate, a lot of the noise of the fricative is cut off, which is going to make these measurements a lot more sensitive to background noise. So uh, with a higher sampling rate, you're still probably going to get effects on center of gravity. They just aren't going to be quite as huge as what you're seeing here. So it's worth keeping that in mind. Um, but some of the other things of note, we have differences in the signal to noise ratio, which is largely about how much background noise uh, is being picked up, but it's also worth noting that a higher signal to noise ratio doesn't necessarily mean that the recording is better because you can have various alterations to the signal that are going to change, um, uh, alterations in the recording that are going to change the signal to noise ratio, um, which are still altering the recording. So basically you want to think about, well, you know, if we're boosting certain frequencies that are common um, in speech that is going to make it look like we have a better signal to noise ratio, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily a more reliable um, recording. Um, and one of the other things um, to note, particularly for center of gravity and the formant measurements is that there's a lot of variation by the particular segment being measured. So um, basically you only are going to get significant effects if you have a consistent effect and when I look at the differences across different vowels, you'll see that different vowels were impacted in very different ways. So some of these conditions weren't actually accurately uh, capturing formants. It's just that they didn't shift all of the vowels in similar enough ways to make it um, show up as an overall effect. Whoops. Uh, I'm not sure why it jumped right to the end. Um, okay. So Next, I wanted to talk about um, phase two. So here's the summary of all of our phase two recordings uh, results. Um, again, laid out in the same way, only showing the significant results. You'll see that there are more significant effects across different programs than there were across different devices. So um, the first column that you'll note, this is the one where we just had audacity. So basically you take the recording um, and you play it through Audacity and re-record it um, there. So it's actually more surprising that we see any effects of that at all um, because it's not being transmitted um, anywhere. But it does confirm that basically all of the effects that we see in Facebook Messenger uh, are a result of Messenger itself and not an effect of recording through Audacity. So you'll note that um, there were lots of effects, very large effects through Facebook Messenger. So um, one of our takeaways is that that's not a really good recording setup uh, at all, if you can avoid it. Um, but we see also a different set of effects across different programs than what we saw as being common across different devices. Um, so we see more effects in spectral tilt that are probably related to some of these filtering and frequency boosting effects. We see more effects in duration, which is probably a result of some of the um, patterns in compression, which also can change um, the measurement of uh, other timing things like where the F0 peak occurs. And, and you'll note that we don't see as many formant effects, but this is partially because the measurements across vowels are even more uh, variable here. So, so part of the thing to take away is just that there is a lot of variation based on the particular condition being used. It isn't that certain measurements are consistently always affected, but you have some differences in which measurements are affected uh, in which conditions. So one of the things that's also worth noting is that we tried comparing several different Zoom conditions. Um, even though we ended up just reporting one of them for the comparison with other programs, it's worth noting, um, it's worth considering, you know, do you get differences based on what settings were being used 
within Zoom. So is it that the recording was local? That is, you're the one playing the recording and you're also the one recording it, uh, or is it remote? Was the computer Mac or Windows? Were the files converted from MP4 files or just um, directly from the way files? And did you use the original audio setting um, or not? So this is one of the options you get up in the corner for, um, for Zoom. Um, and it's supposed to change how much you get the filtering for background noise and echo cancellation. But there was very little variation that we found between these different conditions. So it seems like most of what we're finding is really just an effect of the Zoom program itself and not about particular settings or combinations with the device. So next I want to talk about relative measurement. So looking at correlates of phonological contrasts and how reliably we can capture these phonological contrasts using these different devices. So looking at stress as reflected in vowel duration and F0 maximum, code of voicing as reflected in vowel duration and the harmonics to noise ratio, onset voicing as indicated in harmonics to noise ratio, spectral tilt and F0 maximum, vowel categories indicated in F1 and F2, and fricative identity as indicated in center of gravity. And most of these contrasts were captured in all conditions. So even when the raw measurements were substantially shifted in different conditions, you still mostly were capturing these relative values. But sometimes the size of the difference um, varied across these different conditions, and there are some contrasts that weren't captured in some of these conditions. So first I wanted to show just one of the examples of things that were captured. So this is looking at F0 maximum as predicted by onset voicing. So you get a higher F0 after voiceless consonants than after voiced consonants. And this was captured in all of the conditions. All of them found this difference and there weren't any significant interactions between onset voicing and the condition, either devoid the, the device or the program. Though you'll note that there is some variation in the size of the effect. Um, like we have a smaller uh, difference as measured uh, in the Android condition, that is our second device here, than uh, in the Zoom H4n recorder. So, but all of them have a clear separation. So mostly if all you're interested in are the relative measurements to say, is this a correlate of this phonological contrast that's mostly being captured? And this is just one example, but most of the other phonological measurements um, we're in this same, we had this same sort of pattern. So I'm just giving this one example and then I'm going to focus on the, the measurements that actually did have these significant interactions and are more of a concern. So moving on to center of gravity by fricative. So we had several different fricatives and then this is looking at the interactions between the particular device uh, or program being used and what the fricative was. And we see several uh, major interactions. So as I mentioned, partially this is exaggerated by our sampling rate, um, such that you're getting a lot more sensitivity to background noise, but we have some very, very large effects um, that either you end up with two fricatives where you don't find any difference at all in some conditions, that basically they're measured as being right on top of each other, um, even though they're separate in other conditions, or you have ones where even the measurements are flipped um, such that um, one of them is measured as having a higher center of gravity in one condition and in a different condition the other one is. So some major differences um, in center of gravity where you're likely to get um, slightly smaller uh, effects, but still effects in center of gravity um, with a higher sampling rate. So next I wanted to talk about vowel spaces. So first looking at vowel spaces as measured across different devices. So here the different colors are the different devices uh, and each of the vowels is marked with its IPA symbol. And there's a significant interaction. Um, so including the interaction between de device and vowel significantly improved the models, but you do still basically have a recognizable vowel space for all of the conditions. And you can look at the little clusters where for each of the speakers, you really do have very pretty similar measurements across uh, the different device conditions. But you'll see that sometimes they're a little bit spread out. They aren't all right on top of each other. So you get a fair bit um, of variation, but and notably it varies by the particular vowel. It isn't all shifted um, in the same way. So overall, mostly you still have separate vowels where you want the vowels to be separate, even though the particular measurements of what are the formants characterizing this vowel uh, aren't identical. 
And then looking at the vowel space as measured across different programs, you'll note that this looks a lot worse, um, that the vowels are really spread out within each category where they all should be similar, and you end up with a lot of overlap between categories. Um, so you get these shifts that are vowel specific. So it isn't just, well, this program consistently overestimates F1 or underestimates one, but basically it just depends on um, what sort of filtering um, or amplification you get and how that aligns with the different formants for that vowel for that speaker, which is why you get so much of this variation. But basically, a lot of the contrasts wouldn't be retrievable here. The vowels are hugely shifted, particularly in the Facebook Messenger condition. But even in the other conditions, we see um, a lot of vowels substantially shifted away from where we expect the measurements to be uh, and into the realm um, of other categories. So basically, you would not be able to accurately capture all of the different vowel qualities and their contrasts um, using many of these programs. And you might end up with a very inaccurate idea of just how many vowels exist for each speaker and, and not just issues of what's the realization of each vowel. So um, then I wanted to just say a little bit about you know, what to take away from these results. So both different devices and different software affected the phonetic measurement, sometimes substantially. Um, but on the other hand, when we're looking at relative measurements to look for acoustic correlates of phonological contrast, these generally remained clear in most conditions for most um, contrasts. But there are some contrasts that were exaggerated or underestimated or not captured at all in certain conditions. So it's important to think about what the particular thing is that you want to measure with a particular data set and whether that's going to be reliable um, given um, what devices or programs are being used. So this is a major concern for any data that's gathered remotely or gathered in person in different ways. So for things like if you uh, ask participants to record themselves with whatever device they have at home. So when we went about this project, mostly we were concerned, we were thinking about this from a field work perspective, but it's also going to be a concern for experiments or corpus work or typological work, basically anything with speech recordings where the recordings might have been made in different settings by different devices or by different programs. So the first thing that's really important is just always document the recording setup in as much detail as possible. So what microphone was used, what program was used, what the settings were for the program, if the program allows multiple settings. Um, in particular, you know, sometimes they allow, they have a compressed setting and an uncompressed setting. So sometimes it doesn't seem to make a difference, which is what we found with Zoom, but for other programs, it is likely to make a difference. So it's always better to have more information than less, because then we can use that, if we have that record, to be appropriately cautious in saying, well, we found some of these effects are the things that we can attribute to the speaker, are they effects of the language, or are those confounded with recording conditions such that we can't actually evaluate if there are individual differences or not, or if there are differences between language or not. Um, because if you have these differences across different devices or different programs for different data sets, like if you're doing typological work, then it's hard to actually establish, is this something that is an effect of one language versus another or one speaker versus another? Um, or is it just that, well, we used one device for this and one device for um, this other language uh, such that the results might be due to that. So you can also think about um, the comparability of different recording conditions. So basically we set up our recording conditions across different devices to be as different as possible. So we selected different devices with very different sets of settings um, uh, and different types of microphones and so on. But sort of if you can select more similar devices, you can get even more similarity um, across them. So you can think about how much of an effect are we going to expect when we're comparing these two recording conditions that we want to compare, and also specifically in the particular measurement that you might be interested in, how much is that influenced by these different conditions that are being used. So we have some general recommendations, um, which are basically um, both if you want, uh, if you can 
use the same recording um, for making comparisons because you can make a lot of reliable comparisons within a recording and it gets much less reliable when you're comparing it across different recordings with different setups. But also it's better if you can use the same setup when making multiple recordings that you want to compare to each other, um, or at least use very similar setups if you can. So even if you have different people in different places, you can make sure that they're all using external headset microphones, for example, rather than having variability in some of them using internal computer microphones, some using phones and so on. Um, and this is important, both thinking about your own data and how comparable those results can be, but also if you want to compare your results to someone else's data, uh, it's important that you know how both of those sets of recordings were made such that you can think about what similarities you're going to have or what differences you're going to have based on having differences in the setup. And anyone doing virtual recording might want to consider testing the setups that are being used. So if you know that you have multiple consultants or multiple participants who are using slightly different setups, some using their phones, some using their computers, you might think about doing something parallel to our tests uh, and actually saying, all right, we're going to set up all of these devices and see how the measurements we're making are going to be impacted. We also have some specific recommendations. First, to avoid compression whenever possible. Um, this has been said before, but it, you know, is worth repeating. So use lossless formats. Sometimes it's not immediately clear, like some devices or some programs will default to compression to lossy formats, just based on um, it making more convenient smaller file sizes. It's preferable to use external computer microphones rather than the internal microphones. Even if you have a relatively new computer with a high quality microphone, you still get the differences that I mentioned before about sensitivity to different frequencies, about directionality, how much background noise it's going to catch, uh, to catch um, and also about, you know, particularly on hot days, if you have the computer fan running, uh, the internal computer mic is going to pick that up. Um, and Using different in-person devices is going to be preferable to using video conferencing software. At least we didn't identify any video conferencing software that seemed to be reliable enough that it would be preferable to use that rather than making in-person devices. So particularly if you can reduce the differences across devices by using very similar devices, um, you can reduce a lot of these effects just by making recordings in person uh, and then having them sent to you by the people who are making them. And if you do end up needing to use video conferencing software, it's really important to use the same program. Um, for example, Skype and Zoom had slightly different effects. So if you look at the specific alterations that we see in measurements of the different formants or the different other characteristics, that you don't have the same shifts um, in each of the conditions. So it's important to use the same conditions such that you'll at least get comparability within your own data, even if it isn't necessarily going to be comparable to the results that someone else has in their own data set, which is collected um, in different ways. So some of the other factors to consider are that we only tested a sort of small sample of conditions, which are far from being all possible devices and software that might be used. So that's why we very much encourage everyone else to test their own setups that either they have used um, or that they're thinking about using uh, in order to get a better sense of what sorts of variation we're going to find um, across different devices and different programs and to what extent that's going to be consistent or interact with other factors like the particular speaker. We also only looked at English. So you might get different results uh, in different languages that have a different inventory of um, phonemes or different sets of contrasts. Um, and in particular, you might get differences if you have um, noise reduction algorithms, uh, in particular programs that have been trained on English speech data, they might uh, alter non-English languages more than they alter English based on sort of having these particular set expectations about what speech noise looks like and what gets categorized as non-speech noise. So that's not something that we tested, um, but it is a potential concern. It's also worth noting that all of our virtual recordings were run on stable high speed internet connections, which has which basically has made effective programs as small as they might possibly be because we really wanted to look at effects of the program itself rather than other factors. But if you had slower connections, that is going to introduce a lot of additional issues and much larger effects than what we observed here. So just to conclude, 
all of our tested recording options do distort the signal in some way. They alter what results we get, um, which is worth keeping in mind and really thinking about whenever you have data collected in a variety of ways um, that it's important to think about what are the effects of all of these factors of the setup. And it does vary a lot by the characteristic being measured. So even if you have a setup that's going to be accurate for one characteristic, it might not be accurate for other characteristics. And it's important to think about both what particular setup you're using, but also what characteristics you might want to measure or what future researchers might want to measure in the data that you're making. But also sort of on the, the good side, most phonological contrasts are captured reasonably well. So even when you have the raw measurements being altered, often you basically have a systematic alteration within that condition, such that you can still make relative measurements within a recording and many comparisons can still reliably be made within a recording, though not all of them. So you don't want to just assume that all phonological work is still going to be possible, but it's your sort of relative comparisons are going to be more reliable than just the raw measurements. And then just to end with, if you want to look at all of our data in detail, um, we have the paper and the supplementary materials available on LingBuzz, uh, and I've given the link here. Um, so you can look at that if you want to further examine. We have our summary tables, but also each of the individual models and figures illustrating each of the results um, for the individual measurements that we made. Um, yeah, so thank you. I will end there and I can answer any questions. Thank you very much, Chelsea. That's uh, very clear, very helpful, and the results are quite striking on uh, just what kind of effects you, you get through the software. Uh, so we have time for some more discussion or questions you may have. If you'd like to ask a question, you may use the raise hand function in Zoom or in the chat. You can just write the word question and I'll call on you. And otherwise, if you maybe don't have a stable connection yourself and want to write out your question in the chat, you can do that as well. And I'll read the question for you. Um, so while I'm waiting for those questions to come in, uh, maybe I'll just ask uh, Chelsea about one thing that we discussed briefly uh, before the talk. I saw that there was a similar paper um, on LingBuzz. I think it's now published in the Journal of Acoustical Society of America on comparing acoustic analysis of speech data collected remotely. Um, and I'm wondering if you uh, would just comment on some of the similarities and differences between your study and theirs. And I'll put the link to that in the chat for anybody who wants to see this other paper as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we do see some, some similarities. So they measured uh, F0 uh, and F1, F2, F3. And we see similar results for F0. We see some differences for measurements of formants. And I think that can largely be attributed to the fact, well, I guess two things. Um, so one is that they used a different set of vowels. And as I mentioned, our overall effects for measuring each formant differ on the particular vowels that you have. So using a different set of vowels is going to result in different overall effects. So they did look at Zoom, um, but they had a different set of vowels. So they see different overall effects. I think F1 turned out the same, but F2 turned out um, differently. So partially it's just think about what the overall effects are versus what the effects are by vowel and how just using a slightly different set of vowels is going to change your overall effects. Um, the other difference is that, so we had uh, sort of our transmission of the existing recording um, from the H4N recorder so that you had exactly the same input to Zoom that was identical to the um, base recording. And in their setup, they did concurrent recordings. So basically it was, I think it was an internal computer mic, but in any case, basically you're getting two effects in their results. One are what is Zoom doing and one is um, what is the effect of the particular microphone doing, whereas ours is looking at just Zoom uh, alone. So a slightly different set of things, but it's useful to also get that look at how do these combine. So is there a difference between, you know, making a recording with Zoom using our method, where you're sort of pretending to have an external computer microphone, which is really just the sound card um, from the H4N recording versus making a uh, sort of running Zoom and making uh, a live recording. And then they also see effects. So it's not like they discovered the magic to sort of solving this problem. They are, they've seen similar effects. Is that right? 
Right. Yeah. So it's, yes, they do. They do also find effects and there are just some differences based on the particular parameters. They also looked at doing the analysis with prot versus voice sauce and find additional effects of that. So there are effects also of, and then what analytical tools um, do we use and how sensitive are those going to be to things like additional noise and what can be captured despite the noise. Okay, thanks. Teomir, do you want to ask your question? Hi, uh, thanks for the interesting talk. Um, so I, heard from a, a few colleagues already that uh, they are they've been collecting data not necessarily for phonetic analysis uh, through whatsapp because uh, some of these messengers are better than others in the sense that you press button and then it records a piece and then it sends it to you afterwards so you avoid this effect of the unstable uh, internet connection and also in some remote uh, field sites basically people don't have access to computers and zoom and all of that stuff um, now uh, whatsapp is better than messenger for example because messenger allows only one minute long recordings and so on and so forth so maybe some are better than others but uh, you didn't test that but do you know anything about like where would you place WhatsApp in your within your results or WhatsApp or WeChat or you know all these other considering that you're recording with most likely the internal microphone of a relatively cheap mobile phone. Yes, yeah, so that's something we didn't look at, but which I hope someone does look at because it would be really interesting to know um, based on sort of, as you say, there are going to be two potential effects. One is what is the program itself doing? Um, but also what effects are you going to get based on these being through mobile phones? So um, you can look at our data to, say, to get a hint of what sorts of effects are you going to get across different phones, but I don't know what sort of compression codec or anything um, what WhatsApp is using. So um, so I can't say where, how it might behave, but that would be something that someone should look at because that would be useful to know because I do know that yes, uh, that does get used and is potentially useful in that it avoids the potential effect of uh, internet connection, which is something that we didn't address, but is a really important thing to keep in mind because you can't assume that everyone has a high speed internet connection such that you can get these clear recordings um, that aren't impacted by that. Thanks, Chelsea. Thanks, Tim. Um, I had a general question. Just to, I mean, this is an issue that comes up for anyone working in language documentation as well. Just the fact that this technology, both the recording equipment and the software and internet access, is just changing year to year. Mm -hmm. And what might have worked last year, just next year, turns out it doesn't work, or there's a new, you know, uh, device that you had never heard of that came out. Um, so, do you have any recommendations for how your average linguist? would stay on top of what's changing from year to year and to know two, three years from now, uh, are these results still holding or have things improved and changed? How would we as a field sort of stay uh, stay in touch with what's going on with the technology? I mean, I guess the, the main thing there is just as long as you're documenting exactly what you're doing, um, then that's something that you can refer to, you know, if you're looking at someone's results from 10 years ago, say, you know, what did things look like when they made these? Um, but yeah, that's something that I guess we didn't really think about in terms of, you know, are the effects of Zoom today going to be the same as effects of Zoom in two years when they've updated whatever process of filtering they have, um, because that is a really important concern. But it demonstrates one of the things that I don't think you can use our results to basically say, oh, here's this adjustment that we need to make for Zoom and then everything's going to be reliable. Basically, it's just, you know, Zoom is not super reliable for these things, um, and we need to keep that in mind, um, which is likely to be somewhat stable um, over time, unless there is some major update where suddenly something, you know, introduces a new filtering system. So, yeah, I guess the bad news there is probably that people should keep doing work like this to say, you know, we found this you know, in the past, is it actually still true or have there been various updates? It's particularly hard because a lot of these programs don't actually tell you what exactly their codec is doing. So you say, well, you zoom, zoom is doing a whole lot of things that alter the signal, um, but you know they don't have a, a, a web page that details exactly what it's going to do. They just say, oh, but it makes things nice and clear for you as a listener, not for you as a phonetician, what's it going to do? So, so it's actually hard to keep track of because 
uh, we don't get all that much information from these different programs, but but it's certainly something that you want to keep in mind, you know, as we look at things over time, that there's some work that's done this looking at how do you compare um, analog recordings that people were making uh, sort of on cassette tapes back 50 years ago, can we compare that to our digital recordings that we're making now, what sorts of effects are there when we have these major shifts um, in technology being used. So there's some work that's looked at that, uh, less work looking at shifts within a technology as you have a program that's been around for 10 years uh, or 15 years, you know, at what point the updates in that program also substantially change what it's doing. So that's a really important point to also keep in mind that basically is we need to document everything in as much detail as possible to have all of this, uh, as much information as we can to evaluate what's going on just as an effect of the setup. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I suppose, as you say, their goal is never going to be to create uh, good recordings for phonetic analysis. And so we can assume it's never going to be perfect for, for what a phonetic uh, phonetician would want to do with this. Uh, I think we have another question. Is it Tanasak? Do you have a question? Uh, uh, yes, thank you. Um, hello, I'm Tanasak Silikanela from Thailand. And thank you for your very interesting precious talk today. Um, my question is about, uh, from your talk, you have shown that uh, phonetic details vary according to devices and also software. And so my question is, um, is it possible to, to normalize the acoustic value across devices and, and software? So basically say, like establish what sort of effects there are by device and then try to apply that to make the results comparable. I, I think not because there's a lot of variability. So partially it's that there's a lot of noise introduced and then there's a lot of sensitivity to the particular um, thing being measured. So like for formants, you definitely um, have differences based on not just the particular vowel, but the particular speaker such that, you know, it's just about how, um, like where that particular formant is. So there's no way to sort of normalize that and correct for here's the adjustment for Zoom, here's the one for Skype and so on. Um, and you also get a lot of variability. So there's the effect of here's the particular device that we use, here's this particular Android phone recording with this particular program, but you have potential sensitivity to, you know, how old was the device, how good was its microphone, would you get the same result if you used a different program? So you have so many combinations of factors, both based on the setup not being quite the same, um, but also based on what parts of the signal that it's sensitive to that I think we don't want to jump to thinking that we've identified exactly what the problem is or what the differences are and how to correct for that. I think mostly it's at the level of, you know, there are these problems, we know that we have these differences and we just need to sort of be aware of that and try to use conditions that are as similar as possible because, um, you know, maybe at some point we'll get enough data that we know exactly what's going on and we know how to adjust for the different devices and programs, but we certainly aren't there yet. Thanks, Chelsea. Thank you, Thomas, for the question. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter just mentioned, Peter Austin just mentioned in the chat, uh, wondering whether different language versions of Zoom show different effects. I guess I would be assuming that Zoom is, has different, you know, filtering algorithms depending on what language they expect to be used, or I, I don't know if their technology is that advanced. But. Yeah, that's something we didn't test that, but it's something we wondered about. So we did sort of glance around to see, does Zoom actually give us information about, does it have different algorithms for different languages? How is it identifying what language? you're using. And it wasn't clear that information might be out there somewhere, but we don't have it. So it's certainly something that would be interesting to know, because it certainly would matter if you want to do work on different languages um, that either will or won't be identified by Zoom um, to say, you know, are these effects going to differ from what we get for English? So it certainly is something that might be a concern and is worth thinking about, though I don't actually know to what extent it's a concern. So another thing in the category of Someone should test this um, and, and see to what extent the results are similar. That's great, thanks. Um, are there any other last uh, questions or comments before we end our session? Well, the uh, paper is already available as a preprint online with further information also coming out in language uh, later this year. Uh, another paper as well that I've linked to in the chat, you can read for, for more details. 
Um, and I know, uh, Chelsea, is there a good way people want could contact you if they have specific information? Maybe there's a contact you can put in the chat in case everyone has a particular question that they would like to follow up on. But uh, otherwise, uh, I don't think we have any further questions. So just say thank you to everyone for coming. Thanks to those of you who asked the question. And of course, to Chelsea and all your colleagues who worked with you on this study for really doing the service to our field as a whole. We really appreciate this work and for you being willing to share it with us today. Yeah, well, thanks for this opportunity and thanks everyone for coming. All right, thank you. All right.